Well, good evening. I'm Tom Kerwin. This is Yorkshire Radio, Yorkshire's sports station. And for the next two hours, I want you to sit back, relax and think of better times as we look back on a very special season for Leeds United. I'm not talking about the one that's just gone, of course. 2011-2012 has been put to bed. Big disappointment. Um, so we thought we'd cheer you all up this Wednesday evening uh, by looking back on Leeds United's first division title success. This campaign, of course, marks the, the 20th anniversary of that famous season under Howard Wilkinson. Just a couple of years on uh, from guiding Leeds out of the old second second division. Leeds went on uh, to sit top of the tree, pipping their rivals Manchester United to win the old first division title. Now, of course, this was the last season before the Premier League came in. Some people might have you believe that there was no football before 1992. Um, there certainly was uh, and Leeds United and Howard Wilkinson were the last champions of the old first division. A remarkable achievement and over the course of the last 12 months or so, I've been speaking to various players from that squad and of course the manager Howard Wilkinson um, and we put together a real special documentary a, you know, a, a look back, a story of the season, uh, spoken and told through the people who lived through it the likes of Mel Sterling, Tony Dorigo and Howard Wilkinson, Gary McAllister too so sit back, relax over the next two hours as we look back on Leeds United's championship winning season 1991-1992 when Leeds United were champions Here we go with Leeds United It's long, in goes McAllister here's Lee Chapman in the wall, it's Dorigo, has it? Oh my word, what a goal that was! We're second bottom of the second division, with not many points, and the future looked decidedly bleak. And at that point, we actually said, had planned that this is going to take time to, to get back on the road, but because of the potential there, it, we can get it back on the road, and, and we, we're going to, you know, aim for the stars. I think Sterling might whack it in hard, he does and he scores! And Sterling maintains his astonishing record of taking it out on Sheffield United. It's special, it's special and the memories were, were nobody can, the, people can't take them away from you and it's a great memory to have. Sterling, Chapman in a good position on the far post, there he is! And there is the final flourish! did feel in my heart that we'd beat teams in the first half an hour. Sometimes I'd have beat my opponent in the first 10 minutes and it, it wasn't me, it was the crowd, it was it was everything and you know, could they stand up to that uh, mentally, could they? And a lot of teams couldn't. Oh, and the keeper's missed it! But you have to hand it to Howard Wilkinson and his players, and the party will go on and on here tonight. Since 1992, it would be an understatement to say that Leeds United have had their ups and downs, from Champions League semi-finals to the third tier of English football. Nothing, however, has eclipsed the achievements of Howard Wilkinson and his squad in winning the First Division title, the club's last major honour. Leeds United had finished the previous season fourth in the top flight. That was following promotion from the Second Division in 1989. It was progression that had taken the board, fans and manager by surprise. While the goal was always to get the club back to the top, the speed at which Wilkinson had got the Whites motoring again was an achievement in itself. The team had the foundations in place, and once again the manager was backed in the transfer market, spending nearly £4 million on internationals such as Rod Wallace, Tony Dorigo and Steve Hodge. When we started the season, I was, as many are today, still looking for more. As far as I was concerned, I, I, I'd got a very good team at the end of the season before, and now we had a better team, or we had a potentially a better team. Whilst you didn't have the vast turnover of players that you have now, you know, every game there are changes. But nevertheless, teams that had done well had got squads that could support the, the, 
the continuance of performance if you had injuries. So basically it was to try to ensure that one, we had more players available uh, to select from and two, we had more better players in terms of the overall strength of the squad. And, and, and that's how it turned out. Dorigo had come to Ellen Road at a cost of £1.3 million. I was at Chelsea uh, before that and we had some really good players but there was a feeling I think around the club that uh, we kept shooting ourselves in the foot and I really didn't think we had a great chance of actually going on to win things although the players were good enough. Whereas in Leeds I thought it was a, a growing club and certainly with a manager uh, that I thought you know could go on and, and, and do good things. Um, but after that, I, I really was a case of, well, it seemed a long way from, from London. Um, you know, let's go and talk to Howard Wilkinson and see if he can sell it to me. And uh, he did. But we talked about golf. That was the weird thing. When he signed me, we talked. We actually played uh, verbally three holes of golf. I should have known there was a problem then, shouldn't I? <laughs> well, I still signed. But it was, it was a good, good decision anyway. My father is actually, uh, my father's Italian, and I was obviously born in Australia. And he was a Leeds United supporter. And this sounds really silly, but from that great side, that's when he was watching them. And of course, when I was growing up, uh, Leeds weren't in the top league and my dad would say well, I'm a Leeds supporter and I would laugh at him you know but it was fantastic yeah. all those years later for me to come back and actually play for Leeds but we were then gunning for it and that's when it kind of sunk in I think for me uh, you know what a great side they had but also there seemed issues that were always looking back to that side and uh, you know, things evolve things move on you can't always be successful but it was about time that you know we were successful again. Wallace would play a key role partnering Lee Chapman in attack, an England under-21 player that had caught the manager's eye. Rod had, Rod had pace, um, and the thing I liked about, about Rod was that he, could, he had the pace off the ball to get in behind people, but on the ball, if he picked it up, he only had one thought in his mind, and that was attacking people. And they are invaluable. You know, don't get me wrong here when I talk about Messi as if I saw Rod in the same vein as Lionel Messi. But, you know, they've got the same thing. If somebody picks the ball up and goes at you, you've got a problem if, they, if they're half decent at it. And he was good at it. You have a problem. Because immediately you're on the back foot. You get somebody who stops it, knocks it, stops it, knocks it. That's difficult to deal with. But in addition to that, someone who picks it up and his first thought is, can I run forward, can I dribble forward with this ball? Uh, that's a problem, particularly if, if they're decent at, at selecting when to do it. You know, and he was good at, at when to do it. He knew when, OK, I better play this away and go and get behind him. Uh, and he knew when I can turn here and I'm off, particularly away from home particularly away from home, because you always had, because we didn't, I didn't tie him down, uh, you always had an out over the top when you were defending. At the sprinkling of new signings, along with established names like Chapman, McAllister, Strachan, Batty, Speed, John Lukic, Chris Fairclough, Chris White and Mel Sterland, and the Whites certainly had a chance of going one better than the previous season. The bookies didn't think so, though, with Manchester United, Liverpool and Arsenal ahead of them in the betting. Mel Sterling had already achieved promotion at Ellen Rhodes. Well, the expectations was, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be better than what we were the season before. Uh, you know, and I would, when I would sign me, he said we were going, he was going to win the league. I didn't realise he was going to win two, uh, you know, because we won the old second division. And like you said, uh, the old first division, which were unbelievable. And he said he was going to fetch players in who could play at this level, who he trusted, and uh, who wanted to play for Leeds United Football Club. And... You know, it all paid off. You know, we'd finished fourth. Uh, again, went back over the season before, looked at the facts. I think uh, by the time we started to have those meetings, we, we'd, we'd got six new players on board. Uh, and, you know, I hadn't signed the new players to not make a difference. They'd been signed to make a difference. And so, again, um, tried to be realistic, tried to be conservative and... Uh, what we decided was that, that we wanted to finish better than fourth. Not better than fourth, actually, to be more accurate, with more points than, and starting with one.
Could we get one more point, Dan? And if we could, wouldn't it be better if we could get a few more? But the first target was, in terms of the end of the season, is as soon as we can, let's see if we can get a point ahead of where we were. We always had targets, and Howard was a was a, a stickler for really looking at chunks of games and working out how many points we needed. And we always worked on two points per game, uh, so that's how we kind of you know looked at things. And uh, I think you're always excited. Uh, I don't know. I'm one of these players that when you started the preseason, you always thought you could win the league, no matter you know who you were with. And then you start getting one or two signings, and then suddenly the the team starts bubbling, and you can see it in in training that you know there's something special going on here but there's still you know it's a very difficult long season so we were hopeful of doing well but we didn't really think we we're going to win the title no A tough pre-season regime took place in preparation for the opening game of the season at Crystal Palace, but due to the redevelopment of Selhurst Park, the game was postponed. Uh, well, I remember having a rant about that um, at the time. Um, I just felt um, our pre-season, as always, had been very, very carefully prepared uh, with a view to, to going into the... My aim always was to go into the last week prior to the first game with... If possible, everybody fit, injury-free, if possible. And secondly, everybody as ready as they could be, physically and mentally, and collectively in terms of our organisation, for the season, uh, the kick-off. And to find yourself not playing was, for me, frustrating. It was frustrating, but uh, one of those frustrations that, you know, in management you have to get on with, so we did. First up then was a hard-fought home game against Nottingham Forest, a game which saw Gary McAllister score the only goal and new boy Tony Dorigo pick up the Man of the Match award. Forest I remember distinctly uh, because um, there was a, a chance for Nottingham Forest in the first half and I was trying to actually cover the centre half but it went out to my winger and he had a bit more space. Uh, but then I obviously went down and, and challenged him and everything was fine. But at half-time Howard Wilkinson brought this up he says, why were you so far tucked in? Well, I tried to explain why I was tucked in. I was helping my centre half, you know, and he kind of shot me out the ground. You know, he, he told me what for. I thought, right, OK, that's fine. But he did that with anyone, you know, whatever he thought, that was it. It could have been me, it could have been Gordon Streck and Gary McAllister, and that's the kind of way I, I admired him for that. You know, he didn't uh, choose his favourites as such. He, was, he just saw the game very black and white, and that's what he expected, and, and get on with it. It's all about, you know, I know how well I've played, but it, that wasn't what it was about, and that's what I liked. It was about the team and the team winning. And, and I think that game really brought it home to me, the, uh, the advantage we would have at Ellen Road. I mean, the, the roar and the... The atmosphere was just fantastic. I think as the season progressed, that became more and more intense, and I could you could visually see it in players' eyes whether they could handle that uh, or not. A home game against Wilkinson's former club Sheffield Wednesday followed, which proved to be a tough draw. David Hurst opened the scoring for the Owls before Steve Hodge equalised from the bench. A lot of people would have been disappointed after the Sheffield Wednesday game, as were we. I mean, we didn't play as as well that day as we would have liked. Um, but th th for me, there were no, there were no worrying signs in that performance, other than, you know, as a manager, you know, these things happen for one reason or another. These things happen. Cir circumstances come together, and some days you sit there and you think we are not firing on all cylinders here. But having said that, you have to acknowledge, you know, we're playing a decent team as well a team that would also do well that season. The season really got going with a 4-0 win at Southampton next up, two goals apiece for Speed and Strachan. That was an important result for a number of reasons. Um, one, on the road to win 4-0 is never a bad thing, for starters. Um, secondly, for me, it, it was the start of Gary Speed really coming of age. 
because he played well and he scored a terrific uh, goal, which would give him confidence. Um, so, clean sheet, you know, you start the season and, and you have targets. We won our first goal. We won our first home win or our first away win, our first away clean sheet, our first home clean sheet and so on. Um, to go there and beat them four, you know, there's a he heck of a lot of targets gone in one game. But more importantly, I felt uh, a lot of the team, and in particular Gary Speed, who would be uh, an important part of that team, would have got on the bus that night and, and, and genuinely thought, actually, you know, I, I'm all right with this. I, I'm comfortable in this group. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not being picked with a view to my potential. I'm in here because, because of what I can do and what I can give the team. Four days later came the first big test of the season with a trip to old rivals Manchester United. The heat was on, quite literally, 80 degrees Fahrenheit at Old Trafford. When the fixtures come out, you always look when you're going to play Man United. Um, and obviously we went there and got a draw, uh, which the fans loved it. Um, going to Old Trafford, getting anything is fantastic. But if we'd have beat them, it would have been a lot better. But, we, you know, we didn't get beat. And we always used to say, if you can win your away games or get some on your away games, a draw or a nick a win and win your own games, then that's, uh, that's winning material. It wore red out that day. Uh, and, we, you know, everybody expected us to get turned over at, uh, at Old Trafford and we battled well. Uh, we come away with a point, everybody happy, obviously the fans were very happy. Uh, and then, uh, obviously, we moved on to the next game. Alex Ferguson was hoping to lead the club to their first top-flight title in over 24 years and were also unbeaten going into the game. Chapman put Leeds in front before Brian Robson scored an equaliser. The two sides would, of course, meet again three more times. Next came a two-all draw with Arsenal at Ellen Road a club which had been crowned champions twice in the last three seasons, a real test of ability and character after going two goals down. attacking the cop. Arsenal are in the gaudy new strip. That's the only way I think we can describe it. And of course, regular visitors to this ground last season. The sides met on six occasions, four times in the FA Cup. And Arsenal didn't lose on any of those occasions. They drew here 2-2 in the league. Merson always looks dangerous. And Arsenal with plenty of men up in this attack. Dangerous cross here, and they could be in trouble. And Leeds indeed were in trouble. Beautifully struck by Alan Smith, and Arsenal have the lead on 20 minutes. Alan Smith's fourth goal of the season, Winterburn cut it back, and Smith, with one sweep of the left foot, beat Lukic comprehensively. Merson tries to show a clean pair of heels to Batty. He does that, now he's got Sterling. Beats away his challenge as well. Excellent work from Merson. He now tees up Winterburn and he's gone through. And a second goal for Alan Smith. And Arsenal really rock leads there with the quality of their attack. So some encouragement for them with 25 minutes left. And Strachan, who converted two successfully at Southampton last week, has the chance to bring Leeds back into the game. Strachan versus Seaman. 2-1, he can smile now. The arms are raised, and it's all worked out in the end for Leeds. It's long, in goes McAllister, here's Lee Chapman, and it's 2-2. And the priceless boot of Lee Chapman restores it to status quo as a match. And Leeds have fought back from two down 
and just as in the 86th minute against Sheffield Wednesday they scored an equaliser so they've got one here against Arsenal and it's that man Chapman who seems to relish playing against Arsenal McAllister certainly played his part with the header and Chapman's lunging boot did the rest 2-2 So after four games, Leeds United were six with eight points. Manchester United top of the table with 11 points from one more game. The big thing about three for a win, one for a draw was that, oh, it will encourage teams to go and try and win games and so on and so forth. In actual fact, it was a bit cosmetic because if we're all getting three for a win and if we're all getting one for a draw, you know, it doesn't change. Might as well say, let's have ten for a win. As long as we're all getting ten. You still got to win a certain number of games by the end of the season. Um, and you still know not to get beat, got, not got to get beat. So, from my point of view, um, in the course of things, at the top level, a draw is never a bad result. If you've got one game to play and that one game you need to win, then it's a disastrous result. But in terms of the season, a draw is not a bad result and we used to work, I used to work in blocks of six games as much as possible, three at home, three away and so the players themselves by then had got into this frame of mind where yeah, the game mattered, that game mattered, that game had to be dealt with, we had to look at that game, learn lessons from it, prepare for the next game but they also knew that you've got to be a bit more long-term than that. That in the course of a season, you know, there will be games you draw that you should win, there'll be games you w that you win that you should draw and so on. What we have to con concentrate on is how we play week in, week out, turning out the performances. Next came a home game against Man City, a 3-0 win and a game which saw Strachan score another penalty, Tony Dorigo score his first goal and a collector's item, David Batty scoring only his second goal in 161 starts for Leeds. I remember this distinctly and you know why I remember that game for, which is the same as every Leeds fan remembers that game for, it's David Batty's first goal, <laughs> which was fantastic and that's when it kind of brought home to me that here we had a player who may not have been revered around the country, but the Yorkshire folk loved him because he was a 110 percenter, and uh, you know that kind of was fantastic for him uh, to score his goal. He obviously didn't score too many, and the Leeds fans. But I scored a cracker. I scored a half volley into the top corner, but he got nothing, and it was all about bats. But I, I understood why, and it, it was fantastic. Dorigo then had the chance to go back to his former club Chelsea. He would have the last laugh though, a one 0 win, and Carl Schuck getting the goal. Because I was very fortunate, I was actually Player of the Year for Leeds United in that championship winning side, but I was player of the year at Chelsea as well. So you're kind of one of the loved ones and then you've gone and deserted and gone to the wrong wrong shirt. So when I went down there, I got booed as soon as I came out the tunnel for the warm up. But what I distinctly remember, we used to play kickball to warm up and you would uh, you know, knock it amongst the players and what have you. And then when it got to me, passed to me, the Chelsea crowd in the warm up are going nuts. Boo! So, of course, what do my teammates do? They keep giving it to me. Every second pass was back to me. So the crowd was hysterical, and it was just funny. And uh, I mean, I, I like the atmosphere. I like that sort of thing. And uh, to win, obviously, there was, uh, was wonderful. Coventry, who'd started the season well, then held the Whites to a goal as draw at Highfield Road, and John Lukic's fifth clean sheet of the campaign so far. A capacity crowd then packed into Allen Road for the visit of Liverpool. Gordon Strachan made his 100th appearance and Leeds got the win. Super sub Steve Hodge again. Post Grobel are up, Dorigo here, a scorer in the last home game, he's come through and Leeds have got the lead through Steve Hodge. The fresh
pressure from the corner kick paid off. Leeds got bodies in there. And the most important of all at the end was Hodge. Chapman going for it. Robillard couldn't get a clean punch. White challenged as well. Dirigo knocked it on and Hodge turned it in. Nickel. And Liverpool have been beaten at Ellen Road for the first time in 18 seasons. Steve Hodge with the only goal after 26 minutes makes it another disappointing day for Graham Souness. Hodge on his full home debut for Leeds. A memorable day for him and for the fans. Leeds a good value for their victory and stretch their unbeaten start to the season to nine matches. Leeds United 1, Liverpool 0. Steve... Steve was was recruited because I, you know, I, I'd remembered him. Um, don't forget, I was at Notts County and I was at Sheffield Wednesday, just up the road. And Steve, Steve had a, an eye for goal, and he had an, an eye for more importantly, important goals. The realization that that people were starting to think in terms of squad rather than team. Um, his, his contribution that season was invaluable. You know, when you when you look back at things, you could point to his goals um, or one of them and say, without that one, and he got important goals. Oh, it's, it's a great scout. You know, Liverpool for champions for many many times. Uh, you know, and to, to to get a result and beat them is absolutely uh, unbelievable. I can remember, I think it was McManaman who probably made his debut that game. Oh, made his, I think he did make his debut and, uh, you know, obviously people were saying what a, what a good player this kid is and, and I can remember just uh, getting close to him and uh, I think I knocked him into the, the Liverpool fans. It was a great tackle, it wasn't a bad tackle, it was a good tackle and uh, I th it was just so nice uh, to, to give him a size seven and a half and uh, he, he, he didn't play very well that game, uh, which... Uh, very good for me because it obviously meant that I could get forward as much as I could and uh, not basically worry about defending against uh, that young lad. We're looking back at the time when Leeds United were, were in the top division and they were crowned champions. So here's part two of the special programme looking back at Leeds United's first division title success. This is Yorkshire Radio. The official radio station of Leeds United. Nine games gone and Leeds United were sat second in the table on 19 points. Four points behind leaders Manchester United. Next came the first goals the team has conceded in nine hours in a two-all draw with Norwich before the first defeat of the season in that rearranged game at Crystal Palace. Leeds, without the influential Gordon Strachan, lost 1-0. The, the, there's this thing sometimes about fake coincidences. When I first went to Sheffield Wednesday, my first season at Sheffield Wednesday, I think we went 18 games, 17 games without defeat, start of the season. Where the hell do we get beat? Crystal Palace away, midweek, uh, awful night, raining, shouldn't have got beat, and we get done late on in the game, um, uh, and we've lost the record. And we go down a Palace, you know, we play Palace again and again. Um, so, you, you're not pleased when it happens, but as I say, uh, you... You, you can't dwell on these things. Learn the lessons, move on. It was back up to Ellen Road on the 5th of October for a Yorkshire derby against Sheffield United. Everybody's free to feel good. Everybody's free to feel good. Everybody's Leads with uh, four players inside the penalty area. Sterling, the long one, towards the near post. And Chapman doesn't get there. Here's Hodge, and the first goal is scored by Steve Hodge. I think Sterling might whack it in hard. He does, and he scores. And Sterling maintains his astonishing record of taking it out on Sheffield United. Sterling and McAllister, I think, are arguing about who is to take the penalty. They are. 
And yet another talking point is to be hoped from Leeds' point of view, he scores. He does. And it's 3-0. Chapman, speed, must be number four for Steve Hodge. And how simple it was. Two for Hodge, two for Sterling, four goals in 47 minutes. And Leeds are running riot with the match. So everything was going to plan, but the Blades came back to give the Whites a scare. Here's Whitehouse's cross. Oh, and there's a firm header and a goal from Jamie Hoyland. So, Sheffield United have some joy at last. Shot for Leeds. Oh, and the back pass. Oh, it's Lectonia Garner and he can make it 4-2 here, and he has done. But Gannon's free kick invites a header. Lukic punches it down. Bradshaw scores for Sheffield United. And it's Leeds 4, Sheffield United 3 now. There are 21 players inside the Leeds half and the whistle blows to end a quite dramatic Yorkshire derby which has been won 4-3 by Leeds. I did, I got a couple of goals, uh, I think one was a penalty uh, when me, me and Gary McAllister were arguing. Uh, what it was, the game before, I don't think I played and uh, Gary played and uh, the manager said oh, if we get a penalty you know, who's going to take it? And obviously Gary Mack said he, he'd volunteer to take it. And against Sheffield United, I, I, we got a penalty and I was playing. And uh, we started arguing on the, on the penalty box, which was so funny. And he's saying, you're not taking it. And I'm saying, hey, you Scotch, I'm taking it. And he's saying, you're not taking it, I'm on the penalties. And, you know, I grabbed the ball off him and obviously it made it a bit special for me to take uh, penalty against, penalties against Sheffield United because uh, uh, I don't like Sheffield United, it's as simple as that and uh, it put a bit of pressure on me actually because uh, I need to score it and I did score it and obviously got a lot of stick from the United Arts uh, but we managed to beat them 4-3 and uh, it, it was uh, an exciting game because like you said it, we, we, they, could, they could have nicked it if they'd been probably 10 minutes ago they, they might have got a draw out in the game but uh, we hung in there and like I said we got good team spirit and we kept going The same day, Manchester United were held by Liverpool, reducing the gap between the top two. Leeds then went to Notts County and won 4-2. Hodge, White, Chapman and McAllister with the goals. That result gave the Whites the chance to go top of the league with a win at home to Oldham after Manchester United lost to Sheffield Wednesday. A 1-0 win did just that. We really did take every, every chunk of games you know, as it come and we were kind of just on target you know, to, to do well. Um, and then you know, you'd look at the next lot of games, think, right, if you can get you know, six points out of the next nine points, then we're on target. And, and on we, we, we kept going and going. It wasn't really, I didn't really feel huge amounts of pressure uh, until you got you know, very close to actually it being a reality. At that point, it was kind of all pretty new. Uh, it was enjoyable. Uh, we'd go out to Ellen Road and I'd look at the opposition and they're struggling. I mean, this is great and we're 2 nil up in 20 minutes and, and on we go. And then we just took that away from home as well. So we just kept riding it. A frustrating draw at Wimbledon followed before a 2 nil win over QPR at Ellen Road, which included another Sterling free kick and Rod Wallace's first league goal. The yo-yoing at the top of the table continued, though. Leeds were back on top after Manchester United drew with their city rivals. And if ever there was a chance to send out a message to the rest of the division, now was as good a time as any. The TV cameras were in town as Leeds United went to fourth place to Aston Villa in what was described by many as one of the performances of the season. short of course, inevitably the moment I say that, he gets it back from Strachan, good looking cross, Chapman's header, of the save but it's Wallace who follows up and it's a goal for Leeds United, and White just got the touch header and it's a goal, what a great start to the second half, Sterling on the end of the flick on and Leeds United have scored within a minute and a half of the restart, and a lovely little back healer, Strachan into the danger zone, it's turned in, Chapman I think on the line, He's got him well here, good effort, saved by Lukic, and then turned over the line by York. Villa have pulled one back. 
Still time for a final flourish, perhaps, from Leeds United. Sterling, Chapman in a good position on the far post. There he is, and there is the final flourish. Chapman gets his second goal of the game. Leeds United, their fourth. And for the third match in succession against Aston Villa, Lee Chapman has scored two goals. Well, it's a fantastic performance because in that week before, we worked very, very hard on how we were going to play against them. And uh, I think it was Daly who's who in their side, who, who at that time was a, a, an enormous problem to teams. And I didn't want us to get caught with his pace when we were trying to win the football match. So my memory serves me right, but John McClellan in to play centre-half and put Chrissy Fairclough, which I'd done a few times, man to man on him. And I remember there's a fantastic clip, uh, which I still can see in my mind, of Daly going deep into their half uh, at one point, deep down near their box. And Chrissy is right in there behind him, stopping him turning. And the whole of our team, defensively, is in one quarter of the pitch. I think by then, Maybe that put the seal on whether people had a bit of a doubt about it. Um, that, that, that was probably the game that did it. Because it was such a comprehensive victory. And they had some very good players in their team. Uh, and to go there, really, and, and not give them a kick and to do what we did. And for there to be behind it. So when the players come in the dressing room, it wasn't just the victory. It, it was the manner in which we'd achieved a victory by people doing jobs. So Chrissy Fairclough, who probably, you know, to everybody, well, Fairclough, what was he doing in that game? We didn't see much of Fairclough. You know, he probably got more congratulations afterwards than anybody for, for sticking to his task, for unselfishly saying, OK, if that's my job, let's work on it. So we always had balance. We always had people in positions where they could exploit the strengths. But at the same time, we nullified their main threat, uh, particularly at home. So in every respect, from our point of view, it was a very, very satisfying performance. Not many games on TV. Um, I think it was Gary Lineker who was uh, reporting on the game. He was the, uh, the commentator, I think he was. We absolutely destroyed them. I think Dwight York scored for them. Um, and it was so funny after the game because Howard said to me, well, where were you defending against Dwight York when he scored? Uh, obviously, he had a little chuckle to himself, but we won 4-1, which were fantastic. Uh, a bit disappointed I never got the man of the match, really, because, uh, you know, making two or three goals and scoring one, uh, I think nowadays you'd have got the man at match, but Gary Lineker were a centre-forward and Chapman were a centre-forward, so Gary gave it him. But uh, great result for us. Villa was my first... First uh, club as well, they're a great club, but to go there and dominate and possession, I think, and when we went forward, we were just you know, irresistible. And you talk about the, you know, the big guy and the little guy with, with Chapman and Wallace, and you get it out wide, and you get it in the... Sounds all very simple, but we just did it. We kept winning the ball back, playing in the right areas, and we, uh, yeah, we, we carved through them. By this point, Leeds United were flying. Second favourites to win the title, it was becoming a two-horse race with Manchester United. There were two of us up there who were going all the way, we were going, you know, fight to fight, and that's what we were doing, punch to punch. And we kept going and kept going, and, you know, that game on TV made a lot of people sit back and think, hello, you know, these are not a bad side, these Leeds United. Well organised, fit, good players, they've got a chance. Two wins then followed. Wallace scored the only goal at home against Everton, while a trip to bottom of the table, Luton, resulted in a 2-0 win, thanks to Gary Speed, and another from Wad Wallace, his fifth game in a row in which he'd scored... The team then drew three games in a row, one all against Tottenham at home, a goalless game at Forest before a three-all thriller against Southampton on Boxing Day. Not the best form to be going into a crucial league game against your title rivals Manchester United at home. Amazingly, it would be the first of three meetings in just over two weeks between the two in West Yorkshire after the pair were drawn against each other in the fifth round of the League Cup and the FA Cup third round. In the league game, Neil Webb put Alex Ferguson's side in front before Mel Sterling converted a penalty won by McAllister. I 
I knew I was taking it. Um, and, uh, you know, there was no pressure on me whatsoever. I, I did fancy it. And, you know, I did put it to the keepers left, which were, which were nice. It's that much noise. Because um, people always say to you, oh, can you, can you hear the noise when you're playing? You, sometimes you can't, you just concentrate on your football. But when you've got games like that, you can't hear a thing what your, what your players are saying, what your teammates are saying. You, you just have to hopefully, well, you think that you're doing the right, uh, you've got to pick the right pass and, and everything, which is, which is unbelievable. Playing Man United for the first time at Ellen Road. Oh my God. What an atmosphere it was, and to play in those sort of games is what you're after. You know, as, as a professional footballer, the last thing you want is to play in front of 400 people that go, yeah, well done. You know, play Leeds United, Manchester United, Ellen Road. Wow, it was like you know, red hot the atmosphere. You know, it was absolutely fantastic. But yeah, I mean, they were obviously a very, very good side, and uh, they were you know tough to beat. And that point. Yeah, could have been the difference. The Whites would go on to lose both cup ties against the Red Devils, 3-1 in the League Cup and 1-0 in the FA Cup. However, Wilkinson was never convinced this was a bad thing. You know, that that was a, um, if you like, that encapsulated that season. In the sense that, um, from our point of view, the, the, the way we were and the way, way we approached games in, in order to get results, um, then the cup games, in, in a sense, whilst it would have been nice to have stayed in the Cups, they weren't such a, a disaster. And from my point of view, you know, being able to concentrate on the league games was more of a bonus than, than the downside of, of not winning those football matches. And Manchester United had a, a very, very good team with very, very good players in it. Um, so we just got on with it. We just got on with it. Um, it. It didn't have the negative impact that you may have thought. You know, we, we just kept kept doing what we what you need to do, and uh, and and you know, we're still in the competition that that really matters. In between those cup ties came a 3-1 win at West Ham with Chapman scoring twice and McAllister grabbing the other. The very same afternoon, Manchester United would lose 4-1 at QPR. Well, even then... Um, you know, it started with the TVs on the buses. But I mean, you know, the reception was was awful once you got, once you weren't uh, stopped at the lights or whatever. Uh, so we, you know, we were aware aware of the result. But the, the thing about West Ham was going right back to the to the League Two Championship season. There was a bit of history because we'd been to West Ham. Won one nil and got slaughtered by the media again um, because we went there to win a football match and we had you know we, there was a way that we were going to do it and I could never understand the the adverse criticism we got that afternoon uh, but the lads just put it down to you know it's a northern team going down to London and the posh London press you know but. Uh, we won one 0 at West Ham, which was a big result for us that that game. Uh, and I remember we went into the game we're talking about now, and there was a bit of history, not in the dressing room or or on the pitch, but a bit of history surrounding it. So it was always it was satisfying to go there and get that result. On January the 12th came another memorable game that was broadcast live on TV as Leeds inflicted Sheffield Wednesday's worst league defeat in over a hundred years at Hillsborough.
charge in the wall. It's Dorigo. Has it? Oh my word, what a goal that was! And again, he's given it away, or has he? A misunderstanding. Watson goes down, and it's a penalty. Leeds United are furious, and several of their players have raced over towards the linesman. They feel that was a bit of play acting by Watson, and I have some sympathy for their views. I've never seen anything like it in my life. Um, you know, I still see him now, Gordon, still take the mickey out of him, or give him a bit of abuse saying it was never a penalty, because he could have changed the game. Uh, he dived, it was never a penalty. Chris White couldn't believe it when the referee gave the penalty. Um, it was unbelievable. And, w well, we all just looked at each other and said, you know, this guy's not right. Uh, and he gave the penalty, but I think that uh, motivated us to, to go on and, and perform as we did. And Sheridan. And he's done it at the second attempt. Garrigo. That's good running and a fine ball. Speed. First time towards Chapman. speed and myself and Rod Wallach on the left hand side I and mean, it just worked a dream you know and then when we tucked in Mel was off down the other side and when he tucked in and we were off again down the other side it was just one of those games that uh, everything kind of worked and Chris Woods of course was in goal for Sheffield and my England teammate as well I stuck a free kick past him so that just made it all the sweeter to, <laughs> to wallop them but that was yeah that I mean 6-1 away to a team that finished what in the top three or four in the end was, was a fantastic result. It was one of those days where where the planning the execution and the result were all 10 out of 10. So, again, a very, very satisfying performance for the players, for the coaching staff, for everybody involved, because it was... Uh, they, knew how, they knew how they'd won it, you know. They knew how they'd won it. Not, they knew that, obviously, by then, they were good players, but they also knew that the hard work they put in the week before had paid dividends. The hard work during the week became somewhat of a trademark under Wilkinson's time as manager. Every Friday was spent on the training pitch going over set pieces for hours, something the players did buy into eventually. If anything, I, I certainly learnt a lot from him uh, in that uh, maybe his training was a bit methodical uh, and repetitive, uh, but there were kind of good reasons for that. And in the end, when I went out onto the pitch and all the players went out on the pitch, you know, we knew exactly what our roles were. And then when you go somewhere like Old Trafford or Anfield or Highbury as it was, you're under so much pressure and everything's going off and you have a corner against you, you automatically go in those right positions because you've trained on it, you've done it every Thursday you know, throughout the season, you spend a lot of time on it. I know David Batty used to hate it, <laughs> but there were good reasons for that. And so we got our, our rewards and I think we scored a lot from set pieces and didn't concede many either. After the big win over Wednesday, Leeds suffered a scare at home to Crystal Palace. They went one down and almost two before Chris Fairclough scored his first goal of the season and a crucial equaliser in a match in which talismanic striker Lee Chapman broke his wrist, ruling him out for the next eight weeks. Leeds then had a short break in action and Manchester United pulled away two points clear at the top. The Whites had a friendly with Bayern Munich in which they drew one all before taking on Notts County at home. A routine 3-0 win, Batty, Sterling and Wallace on the score sheet. The Batty strike a rather memorable effort. Batty, for a midfield player who strikes the ball as, as, as good as what he did, um, he should have scored a lot more goals than what he did. Uh, but that goal, what he got, were unbelievable. And uh, the, 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 uh, the evasion what he got from the fans was unbelievable. You know, and we used to say to him, you know, because he used to do it in training every day. 
He used to white balls in from 25, 30 yards into the top corner, but never do it on a on a match day. But the one against Notts County, he caught it well, and uh, you know the the applause that he got that that afternoon was unbelievable. Well, I hope you're enjoying the special programme we've put together here on Yorkshire Radio. When we were champions, a look back at Leeds United's title-winning success from 20 years ago. Over the next 60 minutes, we reach the dramatic conclusion. Then came the short trip to Oldham, not a game in which you'd expect a huge amount of build-up to, but then Leeds United had just completed the signing of a new player, a Frenchman by the name of Eric Cantona, on loan until April. Basically, as I remember it, um, Chappie had an injury. Um... I think it was a broken wrist, which was going to keep him out for a while, for the foreseeable future. Uh, and I saw that as as a, a serious loss at, at that time of year, going into the games we had. And by sheer coincidence, I live in Sheffield, and in those days when we didn't have internet and the web and, you know, tweets and blogs and... You know, so I found out basically through the local paper that Sheffield Wednesday were giving a trial to a French player called Eric Cantona. I happened to know him because I'd seen him play for the French under-21, either twice or I'd seen him play for the under-21s and another team which wasn't the senior team. And he'd played very, very well, very well. Um, and Sheffield Wednesday had got him on trial. And then the next thing I read was that uh, they hadn't taken him because at that time the weather was horrendous. They couldn't train outdoors. He'd played for them indoors uh, in some six-a-side or whatever. I don't know if he was training or what. But they'd said, you know, we, we want to see him playing outside. You can't imagine this now. Can you imagine this now with indoor surfaces, under soil heating on training grounds and so on? So uh, I just decided to follow that up. And uh, as a result of which, I tracked his agent down and found out that he's still staying in a hotel in Sheffield, not, not far from here found him in his room, this was a Friday night, Friday tea time, and we took him on loan that week. Uh, we did an agreement uh, with his club, which if I'm not mistaken was then Marseille, uh, which was to do a loan agreement until there was a date in April which was set as the cut-off date, um, which all fitted very nicely, but we had to agree a fee in case we wanted to take an option up to buy him. All fitted in very nicely with Chappie's industry, uh, injury and his projected return back to fitness. Um, so that was the story. A series of, you might call it coincidences, uh, fate or whatever, uh, that was the story. Well, to be honest, I was injured uh, when, when Eric came. Um, I'd got a, a, a my ankle injury and uh, I can just remember Eric coming into the, the home changing room uh, with a bit of growth and I thought, oh, who's this guy? Uh, obviously I knew but he'd been down a, down a Sheffield Wednesday and played in the game there and scored seven goals in, or something in a, in a practice game and Sheffield Wednesday said they wanted to see him on grass which were a, a absolute jokes. I, I don't know what they were what they were looking at, but you know, w w obviously we got the benefits from him because he came here and you know what a, what a player, what a player, great player. But I don't think he showed enough uh, at Leeds United than what he showed at uh, at, others, at Manchester United. The Frenchman made his debut at Boundary Park, but Leeds lost two 0 Manchester United went back top of the table. Heading towards the end of February and it was cat and mouse stuff between the division's top two sides. Leeds drew one all at Everton while Manchester United extended their lead to four points at the top before they drew at Coventry and Leeds beat Luton to cut the lead back to two points. Cantona scored his first goal in a 2-0 win. A weak pass from Strachan, it really was. McAllister comes into it. He's going through. McAllister might score. Cantona must surely. Yeah! Kelly. 
Alistair really is the creator. He did all the damage to the Luton defence. And Eric Cantona says thank you very much indeed and gets his first goal as a Leeds United player. Eric, you must be very pleased at scoring your first goal for Leeds United. Uh, content, <laughs> the, the, the premier boot uh, Leeds United. Yes, uh, content. Uh, happy. I'm very happy. Yes. For for the team. Très content. For the team. For me, after. And Leeds, you think a good team? Yes, very good team. When we lost Chapa, we didn't we didn't have that aerial presence that he gave us. Uh, Eric was a formidable athlete um, so he came in enabled us to keep doing what we're doing more or less as you say he started five games I think he came on three times as sub I think he scored three goals in that period um, overall by the end of the season you know the prize was the prize and everyone who'd contributed had contributed in some way or, or other and he'd done that. I think when it grated I got the impression from one or two of the players afterwards that that they're, they're, you know that some of them who would you know not I think was it Chrissy White didn't miss a game I mean there were one or two you, you know didn't miss a game um, so they sort of thought you know what's going on but I mean you know, by then you'd start to see the real impact of the media because, you know, he had the accent and, and, and the mannerisms and so on and so forth. So, um, no, from everybody's point of view, I would have thought that was a very, very satisfactory outcome, apart from the chairman who, uh, who uh, we couldn't afford to pay the fee that, that we had to pay. And I remember that deadline coming up and it coincided with a home game before the deadline was something on the Monday. And he came on, I think, and scored one of, one of his three goals, was a terrific sole effort. Where he got it in the box, flicked it up in the air over somebody, ran round and volleyed it in. Might have been Chelsea at home, I'm not sure. Yeah. And that, that was, I think, the last goal. And I remember uh, Leslie Silver, the chairman, sort of, because the crowd went wild, I remember Leslie digging me in the ribs and said, that's just cost me a million quid, you know. Um, and we were between a, ro a rock and a hard place, as was he, because on the Monday, you know, we had to give them an answer, and we were still in with a chance. And, you know, to, to be great credit to Leslie, he, he, he agreed to if you like fun that injuries were now taking their toll on Wilco's squad Chapman was still out and now Rod Wallace missed games after bruising his shin the visit of Aston Villa saw Dorigo miss the game and Strachan miss a penalty nil-nil while the Red Devils continued their cup campaigns Leeds got their act together at Tottenham a 3-1 win John Newsom, McAllister and Wallace with the goals Leeds were now two points clear although their rivals had two games in hand with two months of the season to go, Leeds had a great chance of becoming champions. The manager was in no doubt he had a squad full of top players, and in particular a top midfield, with Strachan, Batty, Speed and McAllister. It was a fantastic midfield. I mean, even by any standards, it was a fantastic midfield. Um, because they all had outstanding qualities, um, in addition to just being generally good at the job. Um, and it was a great blend, great blend. So, and it was a very flexible midfield. As I've already said, people said we played 4-4-2. We, 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 we very rarely played 4-4-2. I mean, Gordon very rarely played, as it were, as just purely a wide player. So, and the, the, the team knew how we played. It wasn't something that, that they just did, so... Gary Speed would some, sometimes start wide. Uh, he would some, sometimes start tucked in. Uh, if he started tucked in, he knew when to get wide. Um, David Batty was what they'd now call an anchor man. You know, he 
sat there in front of the two centre backs, uh, almost like a Hoover. He was frustrating at times because he did it all wrong. You know, he would follow the ball. He'd go close a man down, the man would stick the ball off, Gary, uh, David would go follow it. So if you Gary McAllister like, you see David Batty coming to press your man and you're thinking, where am I going to go? The, the, the thing was that Batty actually got there and won the ball. Uh, he seemed to smell where, where danger was. So if the centre-halves went up and they got beat and the other centre-half had got pulled out, he'd be there picking up the ball that might have been uh, a problem to you. Gary McAllister had an exceptional uh, range of passes and touch and vision. Um, Gary Speed was fantastic in both boxes. Fantastic. And professional enough to do a job you know, wherever he was asked to go. So if he was asked to go uh, left midfield, he went there. If he was asked to go wide, he went there. He played full-back. I even, I think, on one occasion, played him at centre-back. I, I think, I think, during the course of his time, at least, maybe apart from goal, he had at some time played in every position. Um, and they could all play. Uh, 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 Gary could could get a goal, he was fantastic in the air, brave. Uh, and, and Gordon was just the, the modern idea of a wide player. He'd come in off the line, get the ball in the hole where, you know, which is now commonplace. So from our point of view, we were very difficult to read, you know, in terms of how we played, very difficult to read. Um, and it was... You know, Manchester United will argue different, but I think take the four of them against any four in the league at the time and they were the best. Beating Tottenham, the second trip to London in the space of a few days resulted in a 4-1 defeat at QPR. By then, we, you know, both result and performance-wise, we'd we'd stuttered a bit. Um, and uh, I remember talking to them uh, around that time and just repeating, repeating. The messages was, which were, were, look, you know, we are on target to do what we said. Um, we do, ha teams do go through these periods. I remember when we won, when we got promoted from the second division, we had a similar period. I think at one stage in the season, we were 10 or 11 or 12 points ahead going into Easter time or whenever. Uh, we had a period where we couldn't, we weren't picking up the wins, uh, but came through in the end. Um, and it was a case of, you know, I used to say to them, keep reminding them that all, all the best golfers, when, when you listen to them, you talk to them and you hear the coaches and the experts, is how important it is to get a swing you can rely on and trust your swing. Uh, you know, don't think about the hazards, don't think about the pitfalls, don't think about being one shot off winning the open, just trust your swing, concentrate on the shot, shot, um, and that we sh we've we got to do that. We put a lot of work in, we've got to keep doing what we're doing, um, but we need to do this and this and this better. 
but you know, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater at this stage. The microscope was on the whites. Were they cracking at the most crucial of stages? Well, a 5-1 home win over Wimbledon answered those questions, or so it seemed. Two successive draws followed, away at Arsenal and at home to West Ham. Manchester United were two points behind with two games in hand still after they lost to Forest in midweek. Well, I, I, to be honest, I don't think the squad got got really involved in it. You know, if you've got two games in hand, we just, you've got to win them games. And you know in football, anything can happen. Anything can happen. Any, anybody can upset you. You know, you, you've got two games, you've got to win them. Sometimes you, you're probably not winning none, none of them. And then uh, it's all changed again. But we, we just kept going. We just kept going. As far, you can look ahead and you look at all the fixture lists, but you know, we, we do this every season. Towards the end of the season, you think, right, last six games, you know how they're going to... Well, no, they don't. They never go that way, so you can't. So all you can do is prepare for the next game. So we really did try and keep in... You know, in the moment. I know golfers say the same thing, but football, it is just about the next game. And all we can ever do is go out there and prepare, prepare correctly and give it your best shot. But certainly, you know, trying to, to keep out the forces outside of the press and the fans and everything else got more and more difficult, but that's, that's natural. So here came the final month of the season, six games to go and Leeds started off with a 4-0 loss at Main Road against Man City. With Manchester United going back to the top of the table, they had a run of four games in six days. We didn't lose 2-1 uh, or 3-2 or 1-0, well, we, we got a battering. Uh, but again, you know, we just couldn't wait for the next game to come, come round and uh, like I said, the group players that we had were fantastic and we just kept going. It's so hard to talk to you with fellas hanging round you all the time I want you for my sweet bit, but you keep playing hard to get And I'm going round in circles all the time I said to the players on Monday, having come home and spent Sunday morning going over my records and stats, I sat the players down and said, look, we've got five games left and I've decided that this team that I'm going to tell you will start those five games unless we have injuries. Uh, one of those games, I'll make one change if, uh, providing we don't have injuries. And the target is this. We have to win four out of those five and we have to get a point at Liverpool. And the reason we have to do that is because that means if we can do that, because I'm confident we can win the last game, if we can go to Sheffield United and win, by then, I think Manchester United could have to go to Liverpool needing a draw or even a win. We don't know any of that, but if we can make that Liverpool game a, an important game, I, I, I don't see them, Liverpool, even though they weren't playing at the best, getting a, giving them a result that afternoon. Particularly if we, if we by then, have ramped up the pressure. So by then I said, what we need to be is, we need to have won two games, drawn one, and we need to go and win that one. And that gives us ten points. And then we've got a home game in which, in which I'm saying, you will get a win there if you need to. Um, so the next morning, there's a knock on my door, nine o'clock, quarter to nine, it's Gordon Strachan. And he comes in and he says, uh, just come in to save you the embarrassment of telling me that I'm the one who's going to get left out at Liverpool, all things being equal. And uh, I said, all oh, right, OK. He said, yeah, I've worked that one out. I said, OK. 
I said, you worked out the reason? He said, yeah. Yeah, I know the reason. He said, uh, you want us to be tighter defensively. And uh, so you're going to play. I, I think you'll be playing four midfielders across the, the park. I said, yeah, you're dead right. Um, I said, but you missed the other reason. He said, what's that? I said, I want you fresh, fresh for the uh, the last games and fit. Um, so I said, OK. Man City then drew with their rivals before Leeds welcomed Chelsea to Ellen Road. The Frenchman Cantona scored one of the goals of the season in a 3-0 win. The man, he's, he was some, some boy. I actually played against him for England under-21s, against France under-21s uh, at Highbury, many, a few years before that. And uh, he was obviously their star man up front, and he was just a powerhouse, you know, even at that age. And then when he, when he came, uh, the one moment stands out for me incredibly up on this car park that is, used to be the training ground at Ellen Road. Uh, we were playing a game and the goals were moved in to the 18-yard box. So you imagine 20 yards up the pitch. And John Lukic has thrown one out to the right-hand side of the pitch. And Eric Cantona, it's gone over his right-hand shoulder on the halfway line. And he, as it's falling, it hasn't bounced, and he has volleyed it first time straight into the far top corner, 35 yards away, and scored. I've never seen them like it. And I've looked at that, and I've just stopped. And I'm waiting, and now if any of the players score a goal like that, you'll go silly, you'll go nuts. Yeah. Eric just jogged back as if, right, come on, let's just keep going. Yeah. And I'm looking, at, I'm thinking, my God, this boy can play. And OK, he had some bits that he might not have been able to do. I think that was a difficulty for, for the manager to try and work them out. However, within the players, I think we knew that, OK, I'm quite happy to give an extra little bit knowing that he could maybe just be the difference. And that Chelsea game, thigh thigh goal, those sort of moments what, uh, you know, is what really helped us. We knew he'd always got that in his locker. Um, yeah, he used to do that regular on the training pitch. Uh, used to, some of the things he used to do were, were absolutely fantastic. And obviously to do it on the training pitch and then to go on the, the big stage, as we say, and, and do it shows what a footballer he was. Uh, but a uh, great time to score as well. Well, I really hope you're enjoying our look back at Leeds United's First Division title success tonight. When we were champions, we've reached the final chapter, the final part, and we reflect on that dramatic penultimate day of the season in which Leeds United were crowned champions and the celebrations that followed. This is Yorkshire Radio, the official radio station of Leeds United. Lee Chapman and Rod Wallace scored the other goals in a crucial win before the Easter period in which Leeds picked up four points from their two games while Manchester United only managed one point from three. This is where the momentum swung. Leeds earned a hard four points at Liverpool with the match ending goalless before a 2-0 win against Coventry at home in the late kickoff. That was after Alex Ferguson's side lost 2-1 at Forest and then 1-0 at West Ham. The season had turned around, just as Wilco had predicted. Leeds were now favourites for the title, sat one point ahead of Manchester United with two games left to play. On the 26th of April, Leeds would go to Sheffield United before Manchester United went to Liverpool. opportunity to get an equaliser before the second half. They've got a free kick, foul by Beasley on Chapman. Strachan takes it quickly towards Wallace. Was he brought down by the goalkeeper? It might not matter anyway. Speed, Wallace. It could be the most unusual goal of the season. It could be one of the most important. A bizarre goal. It really was a strange one.
Sheffield United and possibly more importantly for Manchester United. And he has delivered it well and the keeper's missed it. Good corner as well. And Pendleton takes it and it's gone in. It's an equalising goal. I'm sure we got someone else when Pendleton turned it in. There were a pile of bodies on the near post. Here's Dean. Cleared by speed. Held up in the wind for Chapman. He finds Cantona. Wallace going through quickly. It's lifted back towards Cantona. the weirdest game and I remember silly things about that game as well uh, well not silly things Brian Gale what a wonderful goal thank you very much great header <laughs> but it was things like the wind and I remember so many uh, packets of crisps and flying around the, the pitch and it was just like a, a really strange sensation I mean, it felt like in control of what we were doing we'd go there and score no problems at all but then they, they got a crazy goal and then it was just one of them strange strange games so but we got the right result you know we, uh, we won the game and of course then I just headed straight home to watch the game later on. A game in which Liverpool ran out winners, meaning Leeds United were champions. We were played in Sheffield, so uh, I invited uh, the, the then chief exec and a director at Leeds, Bill Fotherby and his wife. So I said, let's go back to our house, have some lunch, have a couple of friends there as well, I think, have some lunch, um, you know, and uh, enjoy a proper Sunday um, so that's what was happening uh, we sat having lunch and my, my son Ben who was then five-ish he wandered off to go and watch the television and, and I said you know we're having lunch nobody we don't want to know the result 
Let's enjoy ourselves, have the lunch. The, the result will be the result. And he came down the stairs. Um, Dad, Liverpool are winning 1-0. And then, and Dad, oh, Liverpool are winning 2-0. And of course the table's emptied. So I'm left there sitting on my own, eating my lunch, while they're all dancing around and oh, three minutes to go, oh, one minute to go, oh, no minutes to go. Um, and then pff, within an hour it's chaos outside the house with the media. Sometimes I feel like throwing my hands up in the air. I know I can count on you. Sometimes I feel like saying, Lord, I just don't care. But you've got the love I need to see me through. Well, I, I went to home because obviously I'd come from, from the game at Bremer Lane. I had all my crutches, I went home and I didn't even have the telly on at all. N nothing whatsoever. I just thought, what will be, will be. Nothing whatsoever. Uh, again, the emotional side of me. Uh, you know, I had a bit all my nails off and everything. Uh, it was just a situation where I went home, uh, I was just having a bit of laugh with my kids. Uh, and then, Telephone rings. We're champions. You are. We're champions. No, you're kidding. Well, then, the champagne were out and the, the loggers were out, and it, it was just a, 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 well, it was a great couple of days, to be honest. Some of the um, TV camp companies got, uh, I think, some of the boys watching that year, and no, no, but I just stayed uh, on my own and uh, with the family and just watching. A bit surreal as well, because you know when your whole destiny. You know, you've, you've done it all for all these games, and now you're watching something. It could just happen there and then. But, uh, yeah, and then when, of course, they went behind, and you, you don't want to get too excited either. It's trying to kind of calm it all down, and we're trying to keep this calm facade, but really inside we're going like, you know, the clappers. Gary McAllister recalls exactly what happened watching that game at Lee Chapman's house. Well, we're watching the Liverpool game, Liverpool versus Manchester United. Obviously, we, we wanted Liverpool to win, which they duly did. So we were, we, were a, we were tuned into the studio, which ITV were doing the games at the time. We had Dennis Law and Ian St John in our ears, and we were watching on Lee's TV the voices of the, of the commentators and then the interviews after the game. So after the game, when we won the league, and Fergie comes on and he's raging. So the big, the big, the big red face is even redder. I mean, it's... You know, and, and, and he comes on, he says, I want to make something pretty clear here. Leeds United haven't won the league. Manchester United have lost the league. So I, I just looked across the sofa to the lads and went, oh, look at Big Red Face, as gracious as ever, in defeat. And then in my ear, Dennis Law said, Fergie can hear you. I mean, I've got to say, 15 years, they tell me he doesn't hold a grudge, Fergie. Well. I'm passing in several grounds, played against them for 15 years. He never looked in my direction once. He's, and, and I don't, he's not a very good loser, is he? <laughs> but that, that, is, that is a true story. He, I, he just blanked me for... But then, then he, he's now, he's, he's mellowed a little bit. He, he looked at me once. So for the first time since 1974, Leeds United were the first division champions, but there was still one game left, a final home match against Norwich. Strange week, really. A really strange week. Um, because you, you... Everything, everything, you know, you, you want it to finish properly. You, you know, there's a, a voice inside of you that says, you know, we've got to stay professional, we've got to train, we've got to prepare for this game, we want to win this game, we just don't want it to peter out, you know. We want the game to be an occasion and so on. Um, but very difficult. It's very, very difficult because you have won the championship. Um, 
and there's a part of you that just wants to go because <sighs> you are tired players are tired you're tired staff's tired you don't realize that that you've lived and that's the same for any manager you know you, you don't realize that you're living your life up there until you've had some downtime and then you wake up one morning and you realize the world looks different it sounds different it feels different that things that you hitherto hadn't noticed you start to notice that you know oh you get it's normal to wake up with a headache <laughs> and then you wake up and you haven't got one um, so it's it's difficult it's difficult but it, it was you know the occasion the, the last game was the what everybody would have wanted it to be bear in mind a lot of them had gone down to Sheffield as well but they'd been a week of partying by then around the city Wallace now speed Wallace again was a bit lucky then I think he might have been trying to play it back to speed but on he goes he's made his own luck Rodney Wallace what an outstanding goal on an outstanding day for Leeds United a goal really in keeping with the carnival we've had 25 minutes and another memory for Leeds United on the last day of the season Rodney Wallace goes it alone and there was nothing that Norwich could do about it but you have to hand it to Howard Wilkinson and his players and the party will go on and on here tonight Leeds finishing on a winning note thanks to Rodney Wallace and completing their superb season unbeaten here at Elland Road in the first division Wilkinson will surely never feel a prouder man he's lifted Leeds United from struggling in the second division to the very top of the tree at the start of the season he spent the club's money wisely in the transfer market and in this frenetic finale he maintained his measured philosophy and refused to let his team be knocked off course a Yorkshire club with a proud Yorkshireman at the helm. And Gordon Strachan leads out the players. For Strachan, the climax of a wonderful career. He's won so much in Scotland with Aberdeen, the FA Cup with Manchester United. But this surely takes pride of place. The league championship for Leeds United. Lee Chapman, the leading scorer. John Lukic knows the feel of this trophy. He won it with Arsenal three years ago. A terrific double for him. John Newsom, who's come in in the closing stages and done so well. David Batty, Leeds born and bred. Gary Speed, a marvellous season. Tony DiRigo, Chris Fairclough and Chris White, the two central defenders in partnership again here. Gary McAllister. And Steve Hodge, who failed to win it with Forrest, with Spurs and Villa. A precious moment for him. Rodney Wallace, who's come here 
from Southampton, Carl Schutt and Mel Sterland, who's missed out on the last few matches, but very much part of proceedings the regular right back. The favourite from France. Twenty-four hours later, over 150,000 people headed to the city centre, where the team paraded the trophy on an open-top bus. We'd be up, up, up in the league, like, but I didn't think we'd win it. Didn't think we'd get it. No, it means everything in my career. Um, you know, from a personal point of view, I've, I've never won. I've never won anything. So, uh, you know, this is uh, the most I could wish for throughout my career: championship medal. I mean, some players don't even. Uh, get close or, you know, have a sniff, so it means uh, the world to me. I think it's my old team actually who helped us out this year. Yeah. Forest beat Man U twice, so thank you Mr Clough. This is uh, the culmination of a dream and it's when people ask me, uh, do you realise or how does it feel? It's not until uh, you start to get to these sort of days that uh, you realise how it feels. Absolutely magnificent. I mean, look at them. It's just incredible, isn't it? I mean, you've got to soak it all in. It's just a fantastic experience, and uh, it's one you don't want to finish. Um, I remember I actually took my my son, and because um, <laughs> a load of there's a load of. Uh, pictures everywhere on the bus and everything else, but I'm actually at the back with my son and we're looking the other way. Uh, but, but just to experience that was, uh, you know, absolutely, and to see them all come out was absolutely fantastic. And, uh, you know, even now looking back at the, the pictures afterwards where, we, you know, we, we got the, the trophy and the scarves and everything else was just really nice. But to see all the, you know, your teammates there as well and, uh, you know, I think we had a, such a, a tight-knit group and it was, uh, you know, really pleasing for, for everyone, really. United were back at the top of English football, a plan developed by Howard Wilkinson and executed to perfection. The achievements of the board manager and players will never be forgotten. It was one of the greatest seasons and teams Leeds United had ever had. Champions of England once more, Leeds United. Well, we, we all knew, you know, when I signed there, I, I knew that uh, Leeds had a great side. They had some quality footballers going back then days. Um, and it wasn't any pressure on us, you know, because you know, I think you make your own pressure anyway. Uh, but uh, we were a team where we went out, uh, we had good players, we knew what we could do, we all believed in each other and, uh, and, and, and like, we, won, we won the league, which were not just good for, for us players but, but it, it, were, it were good for the football club and you know, very good for the fans because that's what they pay the money for. They pay the money to go travel the country watching you and, and obviously hoping to, to bring success back to the football club. To do it? Uh, you know, is absolutely fantastic. Not many people can say that sort of, sort of thing. And I think Howard Wilkinson, last English manager as well, to do it. That's another, you know, very proud moment. The game has changed so much, but 
were probably the last of a, a type, you know, to win it in the way that we did. We played, you know, some wonderful football, scored some you know, tremendous goals, and uh, I just think that the backbone of it all was you know, Alan, Alan, Alan Road. I mean, uh, you know, I really did feel in my heart that we'd beat teams in the first half an hour. Sometimes I'd have beat my opponent in the first 10 minutes. And it, it wasn't me, it was the crowd, it was, it was everything. And you know, could they stand up to that? Uh, mentally, could they? And a lot of teams couldn't. In terms of, of, of actually, you know, it, it's, it is the gold ribbon. I mean, people have won it four, five, six times, seven times, you know. But to have won it, uh, at the time, you didn't realise it. The pity about that was that, you know, and, and you say this, but, but people don't believe you. In the overall scheme of things, it had come two, possibly three years before any of the significant people in that scenario had had planned for. So when I'd sat down with the chairman, Leslie, and then later with Bill Fotherby and Peter Gilman, who by then were the prominent three, and we'd looked and mapped the way forward, and and they'd bought into what I was proposing. Um, when I got to the club, we didn't own the ground. The training ground was very, very poor. We had a debt. We had a huge board where, on which there were council representatives and so on. Um, we were second bottom of the second division with not many points and the future looked decidedly bleak. And at that point, we actually said, had planned that this is gonna take time to, to get back on the road, but because of the potential there, it, we can get it back on the road and, and we, we're gonna you know, aim for the stars. The stars being winning, getting and competing up there with Liverpool and Man U and it ultimately winning it and then building on that and moving on and in, in with all that was the need to develop a very effective youth development system based on a training ground, based on having accommodation there and getting kids who, who lived in and became part of what was going to be the new Leeds with its own very particular culture, its own way of doing things. Um, and that had started to happen, you know, all that then was, I can't come in 88, by now we're talking 92, so we'd started that we'd got the ground back, um, we'd found a site for the new training ground, we, we were using facilities around the city just to give us better training facilities, we'd started to work on the infrastructure at the ground, the commercial side of, of the club, was developing, you know, the, the directors w were playing a very central part in that, in, in pushing and driving it forward and leading it forward. So the net result was by about 92, 93, we'd started to see the fruits of the youth development uh, side of things. And w I knew that, that by around about 98, 99, 2000, we'd have some very, very good kids because what we'd started to do was actually working. It, it was almost like watching a, a daffodil grow but on a high-speed camera. It had started to happen. You could see it and you could see... Um, because winning the championship, it was like, oh, Christ almighty. Uh, you know, all... We're a bit like an army that that advances too, too quick, too far, too quick. The support system behind it was meagre, um, 
as I've already indicated, when uh, when we got promoted and 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 you know the chairman was supporting with, with the personal loans was just supporting a lot of what we did. Um, we couldn't really afford to do the Cantonar thing. So in terms of it, it was like well, we've got to do better than where we are now, you know, uh, which was going to be very, very difficult. You know, it, 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 we needed a period of, of consolidation. Uh, so it, 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 it was terrific, but at the same time, you know, it was like, you know, we need to sit down and have a, have a think about this now. Leeds United have yet to hit those heights again, and with the Premier League turning into a battle of the billionaires, many wonder if the club can ever reach the very top. The only disappointment is that the team couldn't add to their success in the following seasons, but as Wilco says, the foundations were in place for the club to prosper in the newly formed Premier League, with the academy producing the main players of the Champions League era eight years later. Whatever happens in the future, though, Leeds United can always look back on one of the most memorable seasons in their history. First Division champions, Leeds United, 1991-92.